I've seen other people on YouTube talking about this. Um, Andrea mentioned it as well about the hallucinations. Um, it seems like that's a big thing that turned people off. What is that a common um, experience for people to have, or it is? And keep in mind, hallucination is a very broad term. Okay. The reason for the hallucinations is, is very simple. Ketamine works, for instance, as, as a general anesthetic. Um, it does an awful lot of things to the brain, but one of the things that it starts doing even before the full anesthetic dose has hit is something called dissociation. It actually makes it so that your brain sort of does not acknowledge that it's in a body. It, that's why it was a very popular drug uh, for use on the battlefields in Vietnam, because a soldier who had you know, a lot of injuries could be brought into an operating room and he could be given a lot of ketamine to get through the surgeries and they wouldn't necessarily have to even be intubated for the surgery because ketamine supports airway reflexes, um, oh. unlike most general anesthetics. Right. And so they would actually be, have their eyes open during the surgery, but they would not really know that their leg was being amputated. Wow. So it's a dissociative, dissociative effect. But when you're not having a surgical procedure done with that dissociative effect, you may look at your hand and wonder, I wonder whose hand that is. <laughs> because you don't realize you're raising your hand up. Right. Wow. And the brain doesn't like things to be what it's used to. So when the brain sees something that doesn't quite match what it's accustomed to, it tries to make sense of it. So the brain will sometimes let you call on memories and things to try and reconcile what it's seeing. Okay. So for instance, I had a patient once uh, many years ago who was an elderly woman, uh, long, long history of pain. But anyway, we, we gave her a high dose infusion. And at the end of the infusion, myself, all the nursing staff were there with her as she was emerging back into normalcy. And she looked at me and she said, oh my gosh, you were Tigger from the, the Disney. And, <laughs> right. and that nurse was a giant flower with petals coming out of her head. Well, this woman's a grandmother and she was reading bedtime stories to her grandchildren every night. So her brain, in order to try to make some sort of sense of what it couldn't figure out, yeah. conjured up the bedtime story. <laughs> and then we've had other patients who will have some bad experiences. And I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Some patients will have hallucinations or experiences that are very akin to a bad LSD trip. Uh, they will see things that they cannot understand, and so they kind of go into a fearful place. But on the plus side, we have readily available for anyone who starts to have bad hallucinations uh, what I refer to as chemical restraints. We can give more benzodiazepine drugs, or I've gone back to using other forms of neuroleptic drugs that are very old drugs, and they're very good drugs. And we get the patients through the whole experience with little to no bad uh, uh, remembrances of anything. Okay. And we can usually tell during the procedure whether the hallucinations are good or bad, often by the way the patients are acting. Mm -hmm. And also to make people feel a little more comfortable about it, it's a rare patient who at the end of the procedure remembers very much about their hallucinations. Okay. I had one patient who was a very famous person and, and when I, and he was very difficult to control under the, under the uh, uh, infusion. He was constantly wanting to crawl out of the gurney and go do things and uh, very unruly, let's just say. <laughs> right. Even with the chemical restraints, the nurses would have their hands full, keeping him in the gurney. Mm -hmm. Nothing violent ever. Okay. And when we were done, as he was coming back into normalcy, I would say to him, so do you remember uh, what you're trying? What? I was just laying here. <laughs> so the hallucinations are not something that should give people any kind of fear. Okay. They can be handled. And the majority of the hallucinations are nothing bad. It's uh, most people have what you would call a good trip. Okay. In fact, um, I listened to part of one of the podcasts 
um, by these guys. I think you may have sent me the link to it, or or uh, maybe somebody else did. It's it's I can't remember the name of it now, but it's podcast for uh, people uh, that are in in chronic pain or suffering from PS, PTSD and, and and depression. So it's all, mm -hmm. a lot of it was about ketamine, and they they use the term tripping on ketamine on the podcast. Okay. And that's kind of what it is, especially mm -hmm. low dose for depression. I don't like to use that kind of term because one of the biggest problems with ketamine becoming mainstream is the DEA's fear of diversion, which is letting this controlled substance get out onto the streets. Right. And so I don't like to use the street terminology when I'm talking about ketamine, but essentially most patients getting the high dose will trip some. They'll be on a trip. Okay. For the most part, it's a pretty good trip. Okay. Because that, that was one thing of my personal concerns, because especially in the first maybe five years after my accident, I suffered a lot from night terrors, and I'd never had anything like that before. And they were very vivid, very realistic, and very reoccurring to where I felt like I lived in another world when I went to sleep, and they were just horrible. So I just I, I felt like I might be more prone to that, but... So that's good to know. It's more controllable. It's hard to say whether you'd be more prone to it or not. But more than likely, you wouldn't have the same kind of night terrors because it's a completely different circumstance in your brain that's bringing up the hallucinations on ketamine. It's actually almost directly caused by the chemical ketamine. Okay. Well, and I kind of always assumed, too, that a lot of my dreams come from translation of the pain into dreams kind of like that that's how my body's recognizing the pain in the dreams so with ketamine i would assume there's not going to be any pain at all while the, the infusion's happening so there shouldn't be because you're even though it's a sub anesthetic dose still because it's given over four hours even though it's a high dose it's given over four hours um and you're for all intents and purposes somewhat arousable for, th throughout the entire procedure, although we try not to arouse anyone. We like to let them sit quietly in a dark room. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's a completely different mechanism. So, uh, and it can, as I say, it can be treated. It can be taken care of during the procedure. <laughs>